Good afternoon to all participants and panelists. Thanks for joining us today at the Sustainable Transport and Logistics Forum. This forum is jointly organized by Starburst, Remaking Innovation and Move SG, supported by Enterprise Singapore, and is also part of the Singapore Transport and Logistics Insight Series 2021. I'm Sheila from Starburst Aerospace, and I will be your MC for today. Today, we are delighted to have a team of industry experts to share with us the latest sustainability trends and related emerging opportunities in the transport and logistics sector. A silver lining arising from COVID-19 is the increased focus on enabling businesses to be both sustainable and resilient. As this trend impacts the global economic recovery, Singapore companies must be prepared to adapt and seize opportunities in the green economy. Transport and logistics industry leaders being at the backbone of global trade must now chart out new paths with the green agenda as a key part of future strategy and recovery from the pandemic. First up, we would like to invite Lao Chong Ming, Executive Director, Transport and Logistics from Enterprise Singapore to share his opening remarks. Chong Ming is currently the Executive Director for the Transport and Logistics Division of Enterprise Singapore. In his current portfolio, Chong Ming is responsible for facilitating companies in the aviation, maritime, land transport, e-commerce supply chain and logistics technology in capability development, innovation and transformation, local and international collaboration partnerships and overseas ventures. Chong Ming, please. Thank you, Shiga. Hello, everyone. Good afternoon. I'm Chong Ming from Enterprise Singapore. Let me first uh, extend my appreciation uh, to the organizers, Starburst, Rainmaking and Move.SG for today's Sustainable Transport and Logistics Forum. Enterprise Singapore is very happy to support this session uh, to facilitate more conversations and awareness and adoption of sustainability and related initiatives and projects by our ecosystem. I think today's forum is curated with the aim to achieve the following. One, to raise awareness about the latest in sustainability trends in the transport and logistics sector. Two, to share some of the benefits and ways to mitigate challenges in implementing and operating sustainability related projects or initiatives. And last but not least, we want to inspire and enable all corporates like yourself to embark on sustainability journeys. This forum is very timely. Countries, global corporations, individuals like all of us are increasingly embracing sustainability. So it's not just happening in Singapore, but it's everywhere around the world. Against this backdrop, we believe that Singapore companies must also start to integrate sustainability into their business and business strategies in order to remain future-proof and competitive. In Singapore, our efforts towards sustainability development has been ongoing for many, many years. For instance, we have supported Singapore companies such as Yip Transport to trans transform and rebrand itself as a sustainable transport operator. In the logistics space, firms like iHub Solutions have gone green by utilizing digital tools to optimize routes for its vehicles management. We are also happy to see that both companies will actually be working towards introducing electric vehicles in the future. Today's forum is also part of our overall efforts to help our transport and logistics ecosystem to deepen the collective understanding of the upcoming shift towards sustainability from the perspective of startups, SMEs, large local enterprises, accelerators and incubators, as well as institutes of higher learning. We want to identify areas of opportunities for collaboration, and we want to grow partnerships between different stakeholders on every level in the ecosystem. Recently, if you have read the news, Enterprise Singapore has laid out our plans to help local companies to meet our sustainability goals, to support Singapore companies at different stages 
of their sustainability journey to build capabilities and capture new opportunities. ESG has launched the Enterprise Sustainability Program or ESP for short, just last week. Now through the ESP, ESG will support the growth of sustainable enterprises on three fronts. First, developing enterprise capabilities in sustainability through supporting trainings aimed to help enterprises in building awareness and knowledge of sustainability, assess relevant tools and resources, and develop a clear plan for capability building over the long term. In addition, projects relating to strategy development, resource optimization, standards adoption, and development of sustainable solutions can be supported by ESG to enable our local Singapore companies to capture opportunities in the new green economy. Second, strengthening sector-specific capabilities. ESG will partner our industry partners like trade associations and chambers to develop sustainability initiatives for their sectors. Examples of these include sustainability roadmaps, sector-specific training courses. Furthermore, ESG will work with our partner SBF to facilitate cross-sector collaboration and work with corporates to uplift the sustainability capabilities of local enterprise throughout their supply and value chains. Third, fostering a vibrant and conducive sustainability ecosystem. Together with our industry partners and other federal government agencies, ESG will strengthen the sustainability ecosystem through training, certification, financing, and other relevant services. We encourage transport and logistics companies to kickstart their sustainability journeys and reach out to us in ESG if you're interested to tap on the newly launched ESP. Beyond today's forum, ESG also offers other platforms to encourage international partnerships for the green transition. First, we will be launching the Trade and Connectivity Challenge 2021 in mid-October. The TCC will return for the third consecutive year with one of the key thematics in sustainability this year. Second, the Sustainability Open Innovation Challenge 2021 has been launched since 2019. SOIC has just opened its second call for participation from corporate demand drivers, SMEs, and startups. Open innovation platforms like the TCC and SOIC will not only highlight the opportunities that technology and innovation can bring following the disruption to trade and connectivity caused by the pandemic, but they will also play a critical role in enabling startups and SMEs in Singapore to assess the great opportunities to work with corporate demand drivers and test bed their sustainability solutions and capture opportunities from the green economy. I encourage all of us to consider participating in these challenges as corporate demand drivers or solution providers and for everyone to take advantage of this opportunity to come together to address the pressing sustainable development challenge of our time. In closing, demand for green solution, in our view, is definitely set to grow exponentially as countries and industries strive to set practices, targets, and plans to control the adverse impact that emissions and other pollutive measures have on global warming. Being an industry that acts as the backbone of global trade and one that keeps supply chains moving, the transport and logistics sector should move quickly to incorporate environmental sustainability into all our business models and strategies. With that said, ESG is committed to supporting local transport and logistics enterprises in going green through financial and non-financial support. We believe that through working together, through partnering every stakeholder, through our collective efforts, we can embrace this paradigm shift with confidence and certainty as the world moves towards a greener future.
I look forward to a very interesting and meaningful session for all of us here today to learn more about the latest in sustainability and explore potential partnership and collaboration. I wish everyone a fruitful time this afternoon and thank you very much for coming together on this important topic of sustainability. Back to you, Sheila. Thanks, Chongming. We will now move on to the panel discussion. The panel discussion is moderated by Prof. Jin Swang, Director of NTU eVTOL Research and Innovation Center. The panelists for this session are Julius, Director of Asia at Starburst Aerospace, focusing on the air transport sector, Angela, Director for Open Innovation and at Rainmaking, focusing on the maritime sector, and Wai Hun, Head of Move SG Accelerator, focusing on land transport. I will now hand the time over to Prof. James and the panelists. Thank you, and, uh, Sheila. Okay, I would like to welcome my three guests. I will give a sh brief, short introduction to each one of their distinguished background from all three wonderful speakers. And I will also have, I have prepared some questions. I will ask all the three panelists. So before we start, let me just give a very brief background about myself. So I'm a firm believer in the transport and logistics sector, and especially what like Chen said about the sustainability uh, because all the CO2 buildup, we see the global warming and all the issue. So personally, I have been working in the aerospace industry for about 30 years. In the last 10 years, I've been focusing exclusively almost on the electric vertical takeoff and landing eVTOL aircraft and advanced air mobility and urban air mobility. So that is the research work I'm doing at NTU. So if any one of you are interested, please contact me. I'll be glad to discuss with you about eVTO, urban air mobility, and the best air mobility. So now, let, of course, let me start with the ladies first. So let me introduce, uh, let me go backward. So let me introduce uh, the background about Ling uh, Weihang. She is the director of the future mobility and the head of the accelerator at GoBell Investment. So all our three speakers today are from Accelerator. So Wee Han, she is the uh, director uh, there, including before she joined GoBell, she actually ran her own business and has 14 years of experience with BNP Paribas, the bank, and is the vice president of digital and innovation. And she also worked with Rolls-Royce before in the UK, in the Naval uh, Marine Vibration Capability Acquisition Department, so she had led successfully a many multinational corporation innovation group and business model. So she definitely knows about the innovative on the business side. And right now she's a, an accelerator to help. Fortunately, I hear we have many hundreds of audience today. So you may want to contact her. She may help you accelerate your business. The, so that's Leon Weihang. Now let me introduce the other lady, Angela. Angela Norenha, she's a director of the Open Innovation and Rainmaking. So she's in charge for open innovation and rainmaking, tackle the biggest challenging in trade, transport, uh, maritime, and she's, she, her role is to also help startups and collaboration between startup and corporate. Her background spending many startups climate, education, technology sector, company, social enterprise. So she will be another wonderful person for you to get to know in case you also need to have a kickstart in your new startup business. Finally, now Julius. I've been talking to Julius for a few months already and I met him before a few times. But Julia is a, what we call a serial entrepreneur, okay? And he currently, Julius is a director of the Starburst for Asia in the aerospace sector. Julius has a professional career track, ranging multinational company, including working for Rockwell Collin, having their commercial strategy, as well as the program responsible for digital roadmap. And now Julius focus only on startup and trying to help startup and new entrepreneurs become successful. So those are our three distinguished panelists. 
Now, let me start with a tough question for them now. All right, okay, this is the fun part. So imagine <laughs> now I put on my professor hat, just like I'm grilling the students, give them an exam, <laughs> I can get to the question. All right, so I'll ask the same question to all three. Basically, I would, so that the, let me hear a question from all three of you in the random order, whoever wanna answer first. I would like to hear the answer from all three of you. I have basically prepared about five or six questions. So let's uh, basically keep the answer to reasonable length so we can go through them. First one is, since all three of you are working with accelerators, so what do your accelerator work on today? And how do you address sustainability? Okay, so that's the first question. So how about start with the ladies first, uh, Angela? <laughs> Sure, happy to go first. And, and I love a good hard question. Um, so there's a number of accelerators and programs that we run in rainmaking actually across industries and specifically in sustainability. We have a smart cities accelerator based out of Osaka. But the work that I've been doing is within trade and transport and working really closely with the maritime sector to lower the carbon footprint of industry giants in trade and maritime. So for instance, uh, the charters, uh, the cargo owners, um, vessel owners, people who operate in ports, but also the, the demand drivers, right? So like folks like Shell, Cargill, um, et cetera, who need to transport large um, amounts of commodities across the oceans. And um, we've been looking at reducing their carbon footprint through startup collaboration. So whether that's looking at alternative energy production, retrofits on vessels, data-driven optimizations and all those things. And um, uh, we're really proud of the work we do because it's not just sort of, uh, we try to make sure that we go beyond the hype and just be excited finding the startups, but really drill into what will make these pilots work, what will make the impact scale, and how do you unlock the value of this potential that we're seeing. That's what I do in a nutshell. Wow, you're all smiling. Seems like you must enjoy what you do. All okay. right, now let's go to the next smiling face. Weehan, how about you at the, your accelerator? <laughs> well, thank you very much. But um, first of all, let me just uh, reiterate the importance of sustainability. So sustainability is not a fad, nor is it just an altruistic drive. Doing the right thing and creating a successful business is indeed um, not a, contrary, a contradictory pursuit, um, but has great importance in, uh, in, in, in it. And today businesses, um, for example, has a growing imperative to address sustainability. And on that note, I think it will be uh, great to just remind ourselves the various um, CO2 emissions reduction target that has been set by EU, UK, and China, whereby in the EU, um, the CO2 emissions reduction target uh, is, is around about 55, at least a reduction of 55%, by 2030 uh, compared to 2019 levels. And in the UK, they're talking 78%. And in China, about 65%. So what does this mean? This actually means to achieve those targets will require tremendous amount of investment and technological innovation um, to change the way we consume and generate energy to drive sustainability. So on that front, what am I really excited about and what is the accelerator looking out for? So from an accelerator point of view, we focus on mobility from a very broad perspective. So um, the things that I'm really excited about in, in three key categories, um, which will define the energy of the future, they are around battery, hydrogen, and nuclear. So I'll pause right there. And I'm very interested to hear from startups um, that are working on this technology um, to improve the three key areas of energy, um, um, energy uh, consumption and distribution. And do reach out to me on that front, detail the peripheral uh, of those uh, technology. For example, carbon credits, uh, REVs, RECs, totally interested in those uh, startups as well. Okay, so let me repeat, did I hear correctly? The three are battery, fuel cell, and nuclear, is that correct? Battery, hydrogen, hydrogen. and nuclear. Okay. So not just, not just hydrogen fuel cell, basically anything hydrogen. Okay, all right, thank you. 
Julius. All right, the gentleman, your turn. <laughs> All right. Hey, thanks, thanks, Dr. Wong. I think for I think the very good introduction for all of us. I think over in Starburst side, I think as probably all of you all have known, I think we are an innovation catalyst within the aviation and aerospace front. So in fact, I think um, for the past, I think a few years, I think we have been looking out and working with quite a few disruptive technologies that are set to actually reduce the carbon footprint. Because currently, I think aviation as a whole, I think we are contributing at least a 20% 20, 20 of the carbon emissions worldwide. That's why we are very actively working with startups, particularly in the hydrogen space, as well as electrification and sustainable aviation fuel. Uh, I'd like to also share that, in fact, um, one of our startups in the hydrogen um, is actually uh, being nominated as one of the, the top 50 startups by the World Economic Forum. So I think, and I think not only that, I think um, one of our electrification aircraft startups, in fact, uh, has already seen some very commercial success already. So I think, um, and to move on to that, I think over in Asia and Singapore, on, on ground side, particularly in the field of air transport, I think where we are particularly looking out is actually for carbon offset, because I think typically in Asia, it's a huge, I think um, it's a travel market. That's why I think we are looking out for a good startup that's able to actually help the travelers to actually reduce the carbon footprint. That's number one. And I think number two is, I think a big part of that is also to reduce, I think, the carbon footprint as well. I think there's a big focus on climate technology. All right. So climate technology that can um, basically predict better uh, enabling technologies for weather, for our corporate partners, for the industries that's able to reduce, for example, the, the aircraft uh, fuel burn rate. So this is something that I think we are on the lookout for as well. And uh, over at the airline side, because not everything is on the aircraft. So um, there's other enabling cycles as well. So I think we, should, we are working closely with the airline stakeholders, particularly on sustainable packaging, because there's a lot of, for example, when passengers travel, there's a lot of consume, consumables that's being used as well. So this is an, 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 an area that uh, we are also looking at, despite not in our, basically uh, where we are fitting in, all right? So as a whole, I think both on the aircraft and on the ground side, I think we continue to remain active. So I think the really, I think number one, I think we are key track technologies that we are pushing is actually sustainable aviation. I think because that is from the IKO, um, I think standards, I think they are looking out for at least 2030 to 2035 to have um, most of the airlines that is committed to actually have a zero emission. So I think this is kind of the work that, and to bring it back, I think we, hence we are actually launching the Singapore Aviation Accelerator with a focus on green aviation. All right. Thank you. All right. Yes. So Thank now you. I'm going to ask maybe different question, but different, uh, diff different, uh, our panel, uh, panelists. Okay. Switching around, just like giving different exam and question to different students now. All right. So, uh, Wei Hong, let me ask you a question because you mentioned about those battery, hydrogen, and also nuclear, uh, some of the large, you have worked for large company before. So let me ask you, now, this is not about startup. My question about large corporate, large company, where do we see most of these large companies that are working in the transport and logistics sectors, where are they focusing their, on their sustainable initiative today? And are these the right places we're focusing, they're focusing on, are they correct? Or are they getting much traction? Or would you would recommend these large company to be focusing on something else? Thank you very much. Uh, um, so basically, absolutely, the corporations, big corporations are focusing and betting on the right chips. Um, let's take the the big oil and gas companies, the likes of Total and Shell, there's been a huge amount of investment in green energy, you know, various uh, diversified fuel. Um, hydrogen is one key example. Um, above and beyond that, both Total and Shell has a huge uh, investment arm that constantly look out for the latest and greatest technology to invest in and propel the energy, I mean, the sustainable energy um, side of investment. 
to always stay ahead in the curve um, and address the very big issue of carbon emissions. So, and in terms of, let's look at other, other, other companies as well. I mean, one that I feel um, that is perhaps not talked about much, but I feel there should be a light on this is around nuclear energy, because um, the topics on, on, on sustainability. And I think nuclear, especially the civil nuclear or modular reactor is a very nascent uh, market today. Um, but if we look at where it would and could grow to, I mean, it's extremely efficient, it is clean. And if we look at the potential for it in terms of um, complementing the kind of clean energy that we have today and more so going forward and to also provide the level of energy that we will require as the world moves towards greener energy. This is an, this is an absolute wonderful uh, alternative energy. So going to, to, to the study that's been done by Bloomberg NEF um, to, to achieve net zero emission by 2050 and also um, the, to achieve the Paris Agreement essentially. Um, they have forecasted that the world could be in three different scenarios, what they call the gray, the green, and the red scenario. So on the gray scenario, as you can imagine, rather do well, rather gray as, as it's rightly colored, uh, whereby fossil fuel would still be around 50, just over 50%, so 52, um, and um, renewable energy, so this is battery, hydrogen, and so forth, uh, would, would be around about 44% and the remainder um, uh, sort of uh, uh, other forms of energy like nuclear. So this is, this is the gray world that they predicted. However, there is the optimistic, the more optimistic world, which is the, the green and the red world, and it's extremely stark. In the green world, we have uh, the prediction of about 85% renewable energy, um, and 10% of that uh, fossil and the remaining five in nuclear. But what's really optimistic is, is the rate scenario whereby the modular, or the nuclear energy, for example, uh, an opportunity for that grows up to about 66% um, and 27% goes to renewable and the remaining uh, fossil. So there is huge opportunity there. And in terms of small modular reactor, which a few, only a few companies in the world today are working on, um, they could provide at least 65 to 85 megawatt, uh, gigawatt of power by 2035. And that's a market opportunity of about 250 to 400 billion pounds. Um, so huge, huge potential there. That's very interesting because most of the time when we hear people talk about green environmental, they do mention electrification, hydrogen, but uh, usually we don't hear too much about nuclear as part of the green, right? We all know that in, in France, basically they use that over 50% of electricity all produced by nuclear. And now I hear a lot of countries, they actually started decommissioning some of the nuclear power plant for elect electricity. And also like Japan after that, the nuclear accident, right? Uh, so what can we do to basically to assure the public that we can improve the safety of these nuclear source of energy then? So basically there's been renowned uh, research going on in the world. I mean, I could mention a few, uh, Rolls-Royce, New Scale, um, I mean, Rolls-Royce is not new to, to, to the uh, nuclear power. In fact, they power a lot of the uh, sure. submarines, nuclear reactors, as you can imagine. So um, they have deep experiences in ensuring the safety and multiple safety factor level, as you can imagine, with um, nuclear reactors. So I think it's about perception and, and, and public learning that actually nuclear is not all that unsafe. And technological advances that we have today and also going forward will continuously ensure that um, this will be safe and could be an alternative um, energy of the future. And okay. also I'd like to also point out that I'm particularly excited about recycling. And when I mentioned battery and the peripheral of it, um, I'm very excited about recycling rejuvenation. And as you can imagine, you know, as the world moves towards more and more electric vehicle, um, we got to do something about the, 
the, right. the battery that comes out of it, right? Mm -hmm. And we can't just have it dump on a dump site, but rather, you know, reuse a lot of this material. And if I could jump on just to add to some of Wei Hoon's points and to go back to your original question, right? Are corporates focusing on the right thing? I think I would agree that some corporates are totally. And but there's many others also who are kind of stuck in this land of waiting for um waiting for the regulation to shake out before they move forward, right? Because they don't know which actions will sort of be rewarded, you know, what, what the carbon price looks like, how much it makes sense to pay for offsets, et cetera, et cetera. And so there's I think there's a lot of companies who still don't know what to do. And then there's many others who are, especially the big leading companies, like such as the ones that we work with, right, who have made lots of huge investments in this space. And um, John Foley at, at Project Drawdown, you know, was saying that I think it's important for everyone to not just focus on the same technology. Like it won't make sense for everyone in the world to use the same thing because resources are finite. You know, certain industries will rely on hydrogen fuel source fuel cells more, others will need to electrify, others will need to think about, you know, uh, methane and hydrogen. So it's almost this mix. How do you get to that portfolio that makes sense for every company, right? And, and the question to me is also, how do, you, um, how do you as a company, whatever your size is, whatever your industry is, act immediately to get more sustainable today and not be sitting sort of waiting for the regulations to change and for some of the other technology to develop. So I think there are some companies that are sort of under focusing on some of the things that they can already do around sort of data and optimization, which is good for the planet, but also good for the bottom line. Um, and also, yeah, just um, I think collaborating to figure out um, not just everyone sort of throw money into R&D um, separately, acting individually in silos, but coming together to collaborate and then sort of split the risk and split the work, which is, okay, who wants to trial this technology? Who will trial that technology? And then share insights across, because then you have sort of more efficient and effective deployment of capital and more people can get involved. So I think sometimes the smaller companies start to feel that, you know, innovation is only a big player's game, right? But like, can everybody put as much capital into it as say Total and Shell have been or, or someone like a Cargill? And, and the, the reality is no, but with whatever you do have to deploy, you can do something. Okay, Angela, let me follow up on that. So traditionally we think large companies, they're like dinosaurs, they move slow. Small, comp uh, small company, they're agile, they're quick. So are you talking about collaboration? Are there any ways that startups or small company, they can work together with the big corporation? And if yes, how? Absolutely. You're, you're talking to three people who run programs that do exactly <laughs> that. But how can, a, how can a big company come work with a small one besides just buying them up? Or yeah, them yeah. Up? So, no, no, so. absolutely. I, I, I know the fear, right? Uh, the fear yeah. that, let's say, as a small company, you'll be eaten up. You'll be eaten up yeah. in the procurement process or you'll be lost in, you know, mountains of paperwork mm. and, let's say, waste months of time developing a conversation that may never go anywhere. And when you're doing it on your own, it can absolutely be like that. That is, that is definitely a risk. But that's why in the programs that we've created, it's fast tracked with sort of structured decision making and where we also prep the corporates to think in a different way. Like um, the corporates who join our program say they've never in the industry before seen this much open sharing between different companies. Normally people are a bit more protective of their data, but they're willing to share their challenges what they're looking for, where the bar is, you know, if you tweak your solution in X, Y, Z way, maybe we could consider something. Yeah. So we get them to think in that collaborative mindset and we sort of force a faster structured decision-making process so it doesn't waste the time um, of, the, of the startups who get involved. So it's almost like a, like a curated design launch pad and almost a soft, a soft zone and sandbox to be able to, to create. At least that's how I think about it. But um, I'd love to bring uh, Wei Hoon and Julius in to answer and not take up all the limelight. <laughs> Maybe I, Julius, I you like have anything to add to, to that? Uh, yes, the... yes, I do. Okay. Um, I'd like oh, to yeah. give a little spin. Maybe in the air transport sector currently is a bit, I think it's, it's at ground zero, as everyone knows, air travel literally come to a halt. Oh, but despite that, I think a few of our local stakeholders, in fact, uh, has a visionary I think approach to bring, um, sustainability, all right? Um, I think not because they wanted to, but I think uh, truly, I think it's delivering value for the organization as well. So there are two parts that how I'm going to see this. I think the 
the organization or as a whole, the industry as a whole is actually taking a pragmatic approach to sustainability. So I think for once, it's maybe they are starting off, particularly because our, our air transport industry is highly regulated. That's why they are starting out, for example, to work on electrifications and maybe sustainable aviation people. And the next phase, uh, which is maybe in the five to 10 years, will be more on the hydrogen technology, all right? But at the same time, bring closer for to actually uh, address air travelers' concern. That's why they are working with, for example, the carbon offset, I think, technology, which is most needed uh, for travelers to, to actually um, uh, move around or travel around sustainably, all right? Um, so I think on your second question is how do corporates, I think, work with um, the startup side? So for startup side, we take a different approach. So and pragmatic approach as well, because a lot of our stakeholders, because of they wanted, we need to actually operate in a safe uh, and operational environment. Um, that's why I think a lot of stakeholders, we have to dispel the myth about the startup. They are not, um, they have a good technology, but at the same time, they need to actually um, be able to implement and show it to the stakeholders. So we kind of um, roll our sleeve uh, and actually work with the startups um, to do, for example, um, backing them up, doing the project management and hands on with them to illustrate to the business you need to build the confidence. All right, so I think this is a testament. I think that um, we are doing differently. I think to, to build, I think, uh, a confidence uh, to the current ecosystem that startup technology can be better, if not, um, more agile as well. Yeah. All right. So I think with that, I think um, right now, I think the with I think our a government initiative, I think the stakeholders are actually opening up. Okay. So now we have about five minutes left. I will change gear and ask a different question. I have another question. Basically, I would okay. like to hear all three audience. Uh, I mean, uh, to hear your. Okay, so basically, let me use my own background. I have worked in the U United States, in Europe, and Asia, worked in industry for many years, and then and now I'm an educator professor. Okay, so you probably all noticed this. If we have to put the three different extremes, the United States, all the young people, the students, they may not study that hard, but when they come to classroom, they ask a lot of questions. They're very curious, right? When teacher asks a question, they all raise their hand, jump out with, with ans answers, <laughs> and they may not study, but they go home. They tinker a lot. They play with things, right? That's why you have the Silicon Valley. They have this can-do attitude. They invent things. You go to Europe, a little bit more balance. They ask some questions, still not too much, and they play around, experiment. They're a good students. They study theory. Now come the extreme side, the Asian. As, as by Singapore too. Student, I go teach, any question, nobody raise their hand. I have to challenge them to answer, to, to, to answer the question, okay? And they are also from the, the kid, they've been taught to read book, memorize, study. Somehow they don't have, that can do the creative, outside the box thinking, okay? Now, you guys are all accelerator. This is been funded by ESG's Enterprise Singapore, how can we change the culture in Singapore to nurture and create and motivate the next generation to basically be more curious, ask more questions, to basically innovate? Like the, you know, you like Stanford, right? Google, Yahoo, all those guys come out. All they think of us is like, wow, what to do? Bill Gates, they quit school. Steve Jobs, they quit school to do this thing, right? Here, you quit school, you get killed by your parents, okay? So <laughs> let me get your view. How can we change the culture of Singapore such that we can become the next Silicon Valley of, uh, of uh, Asia? All right, how about we, since uh, Julius, you're smiling. You'll be the yeah. first one to answer. <laughs> yeah, so I, this is both a simple and hard question, but I think for um, applicable to the air transport industry because we have the aircraft, and a lot of boys in our society, they love aircraft. So I think the underlying is, is actually the passion, the passion for our industry, the passion to see aircraft fly again, take off. I think this is where, I think what the core motivation is, all right? So I think the, as long as you have a core motivations um, in the particular industries or areas that you are in, I think certainly, I think the young generations will actually excel because information is already everywhere. Information is there in Google, I think you do not need to learn, but you need to have the 
the attitude and the willingness to actually continue to, to want to know new things because it's always there. So I think that to me, I think number one, I think I like to say because I'm in the aircraft industries, so we are we have the comfort of that. That's number one. And number two is perhaps I think then now it, it, it boils into our responsibilities said uh, as an innovation catalyst in the aviation aerospace industries to kind of educate and share with them what are the interesting technologies that are actually coming up. Uh, not in this generation, but for the next. So that they are all excited about it because once I think the young generation that are excited about it, they would be able to feel the ground. They would be able to, to, to want to do new things or want to explore new things. And this is where I think, um, I think with the, what as a government led, I think focusing on innovations, I think this is the way, uh, this is the way to go. Okay. All right. Angela, how about I'll give you a minute and a half and then we leave it. How can we get these youngsters out of their comfort zone? Yeah. Um... There's so many things, right? It's the environment, but it's also the culture. But I think at the core of it, it's what are we incentivizing? What do you test for? What do you reward? What do you praise as cool, right? At the moment, you test for how well you remember stock knowledge, not how well you apply new knowledge, right? You don't, you don't praise people for a good question. You praise them for a good answer. But I had this one professor in college that, you know, I was happy to get a B. I, I was never happy to get a B. But with him, I was happy to get a B because he was so hard to impress. And he would grade people on the quality of their questions, not actually the quality of, you know, how well they read the material. And that for me is, you know, uh, sort of praising the critical thinking rather than just succeeding at a predefined metric of success, right? And so much of it goes into society as well. Do you, um, do you only ever hype up the people who look like overnight successes? when there's, you know, hundreds who are still in the grind and they're not in the spotlight. So I think it's it's that. If you can incentivize the right things by, by testing for not just the outcome, but the right input to the process, making failure okay, praising curiosity and a good attempt rather than just success, um, I think that goes a long way. And also the government support, right, the funding, I think you... It's becoming easier now, I think, to get started. So that's that's one side. But the other side is it has to be okay to fail too. Definitely, I see Singapore among all the country I worked as it. Wow, that definitely that's definitely the one who really support put a lot of funding in. So we for the last answer, we'll go to Weehan. So what are you gonna do to help change the culture of the Singapore? <laughs> do, you, do you know? Uh, I'm I'm glad you asked this question, uh, Professor Wong, uh, James. Um, actually, you've hit a, a very personal note and something that I feel very strongly about. Um, I think it comes down to the fundamental of the education system. And it's not just in Singapore, but I see that in general in Asia. Um, I mean, I, I'm pretty fortunate that uh, um, I grew up in, in an environment. Um, I mean, my parents are really open minded and I was taught from very young to, to, to sort of question everything. Um, and I think what's important here is the education need to be rather varied because, you know, innovation and creativity doesn't just stem academically, but rather it's a crossbreed of art, perhaps, you know, there are certain things in art that could maybe inspire the way or nature that could inspire the way we, we invent things or the way we think about things to optimize uh, what we do today. So I think changes to education system is very important. Continuously encourage people to speak up and question. I think that, and, and welcome that. I think that's very important. Um, and also always be curious and have a beginner's mindset um, to learn and to ask and um, acquire new skills. You know, playing piano, for example, could enhance the different spectrum of the brain waves. Um, so I would say, yes, go out there, have fun, balance it, and I think the results will only be remarkable. Okay, thank you very much. So thanks all our three wonderful, I mean, guests. And if anybody, you have your young employee or young kid, you want to make the, the future innovator, can-do guy, send them over to me. I'll put them into shape for you. <laughs> <laughs> all right, that is what I'm here for. Thank you very much, uh, Sheila, back to you. Thank you. Thanks, Prof. James and the panelists. Uh, it was uh, definitely an interesting discussion. Uh, next up, we would like to invite 
Adrian Yap, CEO of Yap Transport. Yap Transport is a Singapore bus transport operator who aims to provide zero carbon transportation. Adrian will be sharing with us about their plans to introduce electric vehicles and their approach in convincing clients to pay for more green services. Adrian, please. Hi, good afternoon. Hi, good afternoon, everybody. Thank you for the opportunity to share uh, your transport sustainability journey. Uh, you see the screen? The slides are not displayed yet. Uh, let me try again. Can you see the screen? No. Uh, let me try. Okay, I can see the screen now. That's good. Okay, uh, Adrian, please. Thank you. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. Sorry for that. Okay, so thank you for the opportunity to share with you our sustainability journey. So uh, company was founded in 1979, uh, two generations and 41 years later, we have passengers who have graduated decades ago, but are now back in Singapore with families of their own and their children are actually riding on our school buses to school today. Um, we were encouraged by the schools very early on to concentrate on the role of managing the fleet of school buses for them. We found our niche there and dedicated ourselves to providing the professional school bus services that every child should enjoy as they interact with their peers on their education journey twice a day. Now, although you only see the names of our international schools here, our buses are actually used to serve many local school students too. And we have reasons to believe that the professionalism we instill on the bus crew stays with them everywhere they go. Now, uh, Yip Transport, like many small and medium enterprises, we began our environmental, social and governance journey because we believe the direction by our government is sensible. Singapore's 2030 Green Plan is part of the United Nations 2030 Sustainable Development Agenda and the Paris Agreement. We are all familiar with the dire consequences of global, uh, global warming flat by the United Nations uh, Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change. Personally, my sustainability journey started when I saw for myself the naughty but very cute otters swimming along our rivers. I recall the very dirty Singapore river of my youth, and I aligned myself with our government's vision to provide a greener home for my children and their children. Now, having contributed in many ways towards the problem, like Julia said, you know, I have started on a different route for my company to, collab uh, to collaborate with all stakeholders to cut or mitigate further greenhouse gas emissions. So the big why, well, school buses run on diesel here. Julia's plane contribute 20%. Um, well, diesel is simply an unpopular fuel for major cities. So due to the well-known concerns over its emissions, nitrogen oxides, particular method 2.5s, they are only the beginning of a lease of them. I was shocked into action actually when I learned during a conference in the US in 2003 that quite a bit of the emissions actually leak into the school bus daily. Now the International Energy Agency's major studies indicated 
that the transportation sector is responsible for 24% of direct carbon dioxide emissions from our carbon fuel combustion engines. Now, that's not a pretty number to have hanging over my head. Thus, um, I'm very much in agreement with President Halima's position that, quote, climate action is a responsibility that businesses must take, unquote, when she spoke at the recent sustainability forum. My company was one of the early adopters of compressed natural gas buses over a decade ago when the government piloted the CNG alternative as I have always been painfully aware of the dire need of managing carbon emissions. So, Deep Transport finds itself with a special role to play today in educating the young on sustainability. We also have many who are collaborating with us to achieve this goal. Since we are aware that transportation accounts for 24% of greenhouse gases, we imagine a time when all students travel to school on a school bus. Now, this behavioral change would address both the sustainability challenge plus resolve the problem of congestion near schools. When a girl or a boy rides the school bus to school from young, the young adult they become will naturally associate with the use of public transport as the natural choice, not a car. Now, we believe that there is more traction to be had among the young. Win them over and the better for their parents will be an easier one. As most parents would accept the notion that they need to leave behind a greener planet for their children. Our company's tagline is, we carry the future. This spells out why we are passionate about our aim to share the need for sustainable business practices. Naturally, we have to ensure that the bus service is an attractive option for parents, students, and school administrators. Now, in a sense, we started our sustainable journey early. We were already sharing the need for our bus operators to adopt the environmentally friendlier Euro standards from 2003. Based on our fleet size, we are the cleanest private school bus fleet in Singapore, as over 50% of the buses are under 10 years old. We had also shared the sustainability message to our overseas business associates in China and Malaysia. I had mentioned that I was shocked to learn that the diesel emission is actually leaking into the school buses. Thus, uh, in 2005, my Malaysian school bus associates and I replaced a fleet of 30-year-old buses with brand new Euro 3 ones. I was advised that no one had registered a brand new bus as a bus scholar in the last few decades before I lobbied on their behalf. In China, they have already adopted the electric bus into their school bus fleet, and we have much to learn from them. For now, we do our best to be sustainable through engaging with our bus drivers and managing engine idling time is one of the measure. The drivers were quite shocked to learn that when a hundred of them leaves their engine idling away in the afternoon for a mere 30 seconds, the emission is the equivalent of one bus running away for an hour. That helped to provide a proper perspective to them on why the NEA would fine them for not switching off their engine when they are parked somewhere with their engine idling away. We are also harnessing fleet routing systems to optimize bus routes to ensure efficiency, to save time and cut fuel usage. So we are on our journey to adopt the electric bus and we are happy to share with you some of the challenges we have encountered. For one, the upfront cost of the electric bus is a challenge as the fuel cells are much costlier than the internal combustion engine. Although the total cost of ownership is expected to be lower, the barrier is a real one for most bus operators. Currently, we are not aware of any possible replacement of the diesel powertrain system. Thus, there's no way to repurpose the current vehicles. The switch to either electric vehicles or hydrogen fuel cells vehicles requires huge capital investments as the current ecosystem is essentially disrupted. And the infrastructure to allow the charging of a privately owned bus fleet is only just being developed. Now, the challenge is immense as one need only to visit any large heavy vehicle parking lot to see for themselves. 
that said, you know, despite the headwinds, uh, my team and I are happy to have the support of Enterprise Singapore. Their officers have been quick in linking us up with the various government agencies to start our journey. So we are working closely with Singapore Power, who is the owner for much of the infrastructure to address the issues of the electric charging networks for the e-buses. Our pivot towards the sustainability journey begins when we initiate our own climate change strategy, such as measuring our own carbon footprint. Naturally, we are interested to explore how to qualify for the various green financing packages such as the MAS Green and Sustainability Link Loan Grant Schemes. And we are also exploring partnership with both eBus manufacturers and distributors, made possible due to the support of Enterprise Singapore to address both safety and operational challenges. Here are some information we have come across in our journey, which encourages my team and I to bravely embrace the Go Green platform. EY's Future Consumers in Debt 2021 states that 43% of the global customers are prepared to pay more for product or services when the organization does what is beneficial to the society. 64% further shared that they are prepared to behave differently if what they do will benefit their society. Thus, you know, it enhances our brand image we find ourselves aligned with the authorities' green plans. We have access to various green financing packages. So it simply makes business sense. Deep Transport is pleased to share that our ESG strategy has worked well for us and our business associates. We were recently awarded a major tender from a prestigious international school to provide ESG-centric transportation services. We are also engaged as a sustainable transport provider for URA's pioneering environmentally sustainable lifestyle hub at the Old Bukit Tima Fire Station. We are truly proud to be associated with the C40 Cities Climate Leadership Group's Reinventing Cities competition, held by URA, SLA, MPUCS, and the BCA. Singapore is part of the C40, where 40 cities from all over the world aims to implement carbon neutral and sustainable urban features. Thank you very much for allowing me to share with you today. My team and I believe that it is important to note the increased consumer interest in sustainability and to consider this as a growth opportunity, not just another risk or cost challenges. These are my contact details, and I'll be pleased to hear from you. Uh, just one last bit of uh, sharing. Uh, thank you for the first three panelists. So much data is actually available showing that the e-bus is an ideal form of uh, school transportation. You know, would our authorities consider adopting the same financing model for our public transit buses for school bus operators? to accelerate the adoption of e-bus. Um, Angela is uh, correct, you know, while truckers struggles with the range of the electric trucks today, you know, there is sufficient evidence to show that the current range is totally acceptable for school buses operating within the cities. Thank you. Thank Back you, to you Sheila. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, yeah, so I think as a reminder for our participants, if you have any uh, questions, please feel free to use the Q&A function. Uh, and I think um, any of our panelists will be uh, happy to address any of your questions. Thanks, Adrian. So next, we would like to invite our guest speaker, Reza, from Total Energies Ventures to share his views on green energy and the technologies that could benefit Singapore's move towards sustainability. Reza, over to you. Thank you, Sheila. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, thank you to Move SG for the opportunity to be amongst you and to present this. I'm just going to try to share the slides I have. Hopefully, it will work. Okay, wonderful. So, my talk today is really, as Sheila mentioned, around investing 
in a low carbon future. And I want to take you through some of the key trends that we are seeing across the world um, on the transport uh, and the logistics sector. As a way of introduction, um, I want to start by mentioning uh, the fact that energy is very much at the heart of climate change. And so to make energy transition, which is inevitable, and to make that possible is gonna take three things. It's gonna take technology, innovative technology, new things, uh, new way of doing things, but also it's gonna take funding to go into R&D for this technology, as well as bringing this latest technology from the lab into commercialization. Also, we require the government policies. We need the good policies, the right policies to be there at a timely, uh, timely fashion. We need the businesses, um, as well as, of course, the individual, the whole society that requires a behavioral change. So these are some of the themes that I'm gonna come back into uh, in my presentation. So if I can just talk a little bit about uh, our company and present Total Energies to you. It's, of course, the French energy major. We've gone through a major rebrand. We have a new logo. We have a new name. We have a new identity. And all that is to show, is to reflect our transformation from essentially what was an oil company into a multi-energy company. So we are now much more focused in natural gas, electricity, hydrogen, biomass, uh, wind and solar. And it's not just a communication tool. This is a real thing. Of course, it's gonna take time for us to get there. But personally, I'm a good example of that. I started working in oil industry 15 years ago, 13 years ago. And now I'm much more focused on the new types of energy uh, and renewables. So it's gonna take time, but our target is to be to get to net zero by 2050. And we want to be amongst the top five renewable companies uh, in the world by 2030. As part of our commitments, of course, we're gonna invest lots of money in solar power, in, uh, in wind. Uh, we are converting a number of our refineries to biofuel refinery, to produce biofuels, as well as the biogas production. And of course, the EV charging points, um, we had about 20, 21,000, of these charging points across the world. And we are looking to develop that into uh, 150,000 in the next five years or so. Of course, the development of the mobility solutions in Singapore, um, this is the announcement that was, that was done a couple of months ago that we are taking over about 1,500 charging points across the island. So this is a, really a kind of a big news, a key uh, step for the company to show its commitment. Um, and is very proud to actually add Singapore to a number of global cities, uh, such as London, Paris, as we upgrade these charging points and develop the network further on to get to the key target, of course, for the Singapore Green Plan, which will have 60,000 charge points um, by 2030. We have also announced that uh, last week, we have, we've announced that we're gonna have a joint venture in China to develop about 10,000 charging points uh, in China as well. So now if I can focus more on the venture capital team itself, the team I'm working on, um, essentially we are a $400 million fund. Our job is to try to find and to invest in promising startups to help us to contribute to that uh, net zero pledge by 2050. We invest directly in startups, but also in funds. We look at three main sectors. So anything around energy, that means smart energy, renewables, hydrogen, storage, battery, mobility. This is the second sector we look at, new type of mobility and circular economy, biofuels, bioplastic. Um, these are the three main sectors we look at. And of course, a very important part is this convergence of the two areas of energy and mobility which is the energy storage. And this is something we're very much focused on. We have offices in San Francisco, in Paris, and uh, this is where we cover essentially Asia with our various partnerships we have in place. What we bring to the table is not only uh, capital, financial capital, but also is our partnership. It's important for us to find the strategic value 
in the startups and we help to develop them using our sector expertise and technical knowledge. Um, and also this is something we look uh, in a startup when we invest in them. Something which is in the strategy in a technical interest for us. If I can just take you through rapidly um, our portfolio, as I mentioned, we have a big focus on new mobility and smart energy. So the various companies that you can see there. Um, the other sector of importance, of course, is logistics. So I'm going to talk about a couple of those companies and a couple of those trends uh, later on, as well as the CO2, hydrogen, and the storage sector. So quite a diverse portfolio with really a focus on that on those three sectors that I talked about. On Asia Pacific, our focus, the Ventures team focus, is uh, through the various um, partnerships that we have in the fund. So the Cate Innovation Fund, this is the investment that we did uh, in the fund in 2017. So the focus being on innovation and bringing these kind of new technology disruptive technology uh, into the world. Later on, we followed with a smart energy of Cathay Capital. So this time really focused on the energy sector, primarily in China. We also partner with uh, Neo Capital in the fund focusing on mobility. And I will give an example of this, uh, uh, of a company that belongs to Neo later. And of course, the G7 is another company that I will talk to you about, which is very active in the logistics sector. In Singapore, uh, I think Grab doesn't really need any introduction. Uh, also, we are partnering with Canopy, another compo uh, company out of Singapore, very promising, uh, bringing digital solutions to renewable microgrids uh, when we're talking about uh, solar and battery. So doing some very interesting stuff. Okay, in the interest of time, I just want to focus now a little bit on some of the key trends as we see it. Um, in the logistics and transport sector. So the G7 is uh, one of the companies that I was, just, that I was mentioning just previously. Um, so the pain points in the logistics sector, in the trucking essentially sector is with a very high cost, it's very low efficiency, um, poor safety record, the lack of visibility of where the goods, where the drivers, uh, and especially when we're talking about the medium and smaller kind of companies, is also the problem of uh, high insurance costs and very expensive assets. Now, what G7 is doing is essentially a technology uh, platform providing software as a service, IoT, so an EA-enabled uh, fleet management. They're doing some very clever stuff um, to improve the safety record, to, to use geolo geolocalization, to where are the trucks, where is my load, uh, and also to make sure that, for example, the driver is fully alert when he's driving. So they use some AI technology to make sure the driver is not doing too many hours. Uh, and is getting, this company is getting some very good traction. They are working with many fleet operators in China, and they're also looking to expand uh, across Asia. And potentially do an IPO, hopefully uh, very soon. Another company out of Spain is Untruck. Now, Untruck is trying to focus on the, on the pain point, which is the very inefficiency of most of the lorries, most of the trucks that we see out on the road. Many of them are either empty or they're not being fully utilized. So they're underused. And the very poor quality of service that perhaps is more of a European problem than, uh, than a Singaporean problem. Essentially, it's an online brokerage where it's trying to do some route optimization um, and is bringing the different people together to digitalize the whole process of uh, the shipment from doing the shipment and doing the track uh, tracking of the of the shipment but also the payment and digitalizing the whole payment process so again another company which is getting some very interesting uh, result and very good traction Uh, lastly, I want to talk about uh, two more companies which are a little bit different in the new mobility sector. So this one is for NEO. First, I will talk about the four-wheeler, 
know, the light vehicle sector. So like the photo that you can see here. Now, the problem that Neo is trying to address is, the, is when it comes to the EV sector, the cost of purchasing an electric vehicle is very high. Around 30% of that cost, of course, is down to the battery. And there are concerns. If I buy a, my iPhone, the battery after two years is basically dead, right? So why the people are asking, why would it be any different in a car? So there are some concerns about degradation of the battery life, about missing out on the latest technology of the battery, um, and also not really wanting to sit down in, for one hour in a, in a battery charging uh, point. And of course, the other concern is the resale value of the car. So if the battery is no good after three, four years, well, can I be, am I able to sell this car? So battery swapping is something which is coming back. It was something that was tried about uh, 10 years ago by various companies, including Tesla. They tried to do some battery swapping and they opened a station back in 2013, I believe. It was a massive failure at the time, partly because of the cultural uh, differences in the US. Uh, the, Maybe the culture wasn't there, we were not ready for it. But the Chinese, uh, especially the Chinese manufacturers, they believe there is enough space for battery swapping to come back and to play an important role uh, in the EV transition. So the idea is that you will go in one of these uh, uh, stations. It's fully automatic. There's about 15 to 20 battery packs. You park your car and automatically there's a robot that removes the battery of your car and it will replace it with a fully charged one. So the battery is no longer owned by you, it's leased, and you either pay per swap or you pay uh, on a subscription fee and you can swap as much as you want. So this is happening for the four wheelers, uh, meaning for cars, this is a brand new car from uh, Neo itself, you can see in the photo, on the motorbike sector and also on the, on the truck sector. So the Chinese have decided that once again, hydrogen, as it was mentioned just previously, is too expensive today. It is the fuel of the future when it comes to heavy cars, but it's too expensive today. So the best way to move away from diesel and polluting cars is to use battery swapping on the four wheelers. And they're doing some kind of automatically, they're putting a huge battery in the back of the cabin, uh, of, the, of the driver's cabin in a lorry. Um, so it's another one of the ideas that is actually getting some traction in, in China. And lastly, I want to talk about Hyzen. So this is more of a hydrogen company. Uh, hydrogen, of course, we all think is the fuel of the future. And we've been saying that for a long time. But finally, perhaps the moment has arrived for hydrogen. Hyzen is an American company um, that has its origin, in fact, in, from Singapore. Um, of course, as you know, is the trucking is a significant source of CO2 and transportation and all the problem around uh, electric uh, lorries and the heavy size of the batteries and charging times. So Hyzen is trying to address all of that by producing hydrogen fuel cells with their own technology. It's getting some fantastic uh, traction in the US. They are trying to develop their business um, in Europe. So bring in hydrogen trucks in Europe, as well as Asia Pacific. So this is, some, this is a company that we are very excited about, but of course the infrastructure is missing. It's gonna take time for the infrastructure, hydrogen infrastructure to be there. And as, uh, and as a result, Total, along with a few other uh, major industrial companies, announced a couple of weeks ago, the launch of the largest clean energy hydrogen infrastructure fund. So for the moment, it's about 800 million euros that has been committed. The idea is to go to 1.5 million billion euros and to spend all of that in the renewable and low carbon hydrogen solutions all along the value chain of hydrogen um, without a specific country. So it's gonna be all over the world trying to find and trying to finally launch hydrogen uh, as a clean fuel of the future. I've come to the end of my presentation. Uh, I want to say if you are an entrepreneur, uh, and you have some great idea, don't hesitate to contact us. You have our contact details there. And if you are an investor and you're looking to co-invest and looking to explore opportunities also, please don't hesitate to contact us. Thank you very much for listening. Thanks, Razor. I think we have a question from the audience. Maybe um, could you um, just take two minutes to answer this? I think the question is, um, what is the proportion of Total Energy's ventures in Total's uh, overall business? And what is the growth trend? 
and is the trend reflective of the global green energy demand? Yeah, so that's a good question, the portion of, uh, of our activities in the total overall business. So I think I was talking about something like investing $60 billion. Uh, that total is total energies is investing in the next uh, 10 years or so. If you compare that with our relatively small budget of 400 million euros, I think it gives you an idea of, uh, of our size. Um, but I mean, the other, point, uh, the other point that I should make is what we do is we drive the innovation culture in the company. We try out new business models and new technologies. So for the company to launch a whole new business is going to be a very lengthy and very expensive process. Instead, very often it's better to go and try with a small company that are very agile, they are quick to make the decisions, get the product out to the market, um, a new kind of uh, uh, a new business model or a new type of technology uh, to be able to try them very quickly. So this is where really where we, where we can manage the risks uh, in this way for the company. Uh, the second question, second part of the question, I'm not sure if I got it. Uh, I think um, it's on the growth trend. Yeah, the growth trend is always very difficult to, uh, uh, to answer. But of course, we are, as I was mentioning, we are trying to develop uh, around 10 gigawatts into uh, of solar and uh, and wind power so we 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 can see there is really a lot of focus on that and also for us natural gas is a very important element of a clean transition so it's a less dirty fuel and uh we look the lights are going out in china uh, and if you're not going to invest in um, coal very dirty solutions i think we have to be able to invest in something which is a good medium. So that's where we can see the uh, potential of uh, natural gas. All right, thanks Reza. I think next we'll like to move on to the next uh, segment of the forum. We have um, invited three startups who will be sharing with us on their sustainability tech solutions, followed by a fireside chat led by the accelerator. So first up, we have um, Leon from CEO and co-founder of Green Lithium Iron, as well as Baihun from Move SG. Over to you guys. Hi, thank you very much, Sheila. So um, as she has introduced, um, Leon Farron is the CEO of Green Lithium Iron, um, and Green Lithium Iron is also part of the Move SG Accelerator. And on that note, um, I would just like to kick off a few questions um, whereby I would love to hear, and so is the audience, we would love to hear a little bit more about your business and how your business is addressing the question on sustainability. Yeah, thanks, Waihoon, and thank you for having me on the panel. It's, uh, it's quite a pleasure. Um, so Green Lion, I mean, effectively, we are trying to be the circular economy solution for lithium ion batteries. Um, we're a deep tech uh, hardware company. So we've built a machine essentially that can take in spent lithium ion batteries and can produce pure battery cathode material as an output. So we're trying to close the loop by, you know, removing the reliance on mining, of course, of these precious metals, being able to derive them directly from from the spent lithium ion batteries. And of course, we're trying to remove all batteries from, uh, from landfill. The sad reality is that 95% of, of spent batteries still go into landfill. They're you know, responsible for nine out of 10 fires that happen in landfill that combust. But the saddest thing is that they're worth a lot of money and those, uh, those materials are mined out of the ground, which have a huge carbon footprint, detrimental to the environment. And, um, and, and we can just do much better. We've, you know, our technology uses hydrometallurgy, um, you know, very, very small carbon footprint in comparison. And uh, we can rejuvenate and, and, and build battery ready cathode material, cathode materials like the brain of the, the battery um, and we can take in, we can handle every battery that's currently in the market. And so, and we can build any popular battery cathode that's in the market or, or being used at the moment as well. 
Excellent. That's that's really interesting because earlier on we were just talking about the huge amount of electric vehicles that would be on the road um, in the near future, and recycling is absolutely paramount in ensuring a sustainable circular economy. Um, so very excited about the next generation in recycling and rejuvenation uh, technology that you're working on. Perhaps to elaborate a little bit more, um, uh, maybe you can touch upon the USP of your business compared to the other recycling of battery businesses out there in the world. And how is that um, uh, so fundamentally different? Yeah, I think that's a really good point. Well, fundamentally, we try to stay away from the word recycling because, you know, you can recycle an item like this chair I'm sitting on and you can crush it to a million pieces and use it for a building foundation. Still recycling, right? Um, what we are trying to do is we're rejuvenating the lithium ion batteries. So we're actually taking them in and they're no, no longer useful or they're, they're spent and we're, we're getting them back to brand new status again so that it can be used um, used for the transport industry, but also, you know, telecommunications, renewable energy, you know, everything that you can imagine that needs power storage um, and energy storage. Of course, that relies on the fact that we have batteries for the rest of time and uh, we don't have the minerals for batteries available for the rest of time. Fantastic. And by the way, feel free to share any slides if you, if you like to. Um, and um, one other question is, at which stage is your business currently? Yeah, I mean, I don't want to bore anybody by, you know, death by slideshow, but I, I can, I can, if you like, just um, show a couple of pictures. Um, I might specifically show a picture of, of our machine. We... We're at commercial stage, so we're we're manufacturing these these uh, our commercial level uh, technology. And when I say um, our, our technology, to give you an example, right, is uh, the size of a small house, or you know maybe maybe two two apartments sitting on top of each other. Um, the our our machine is uh, sort of. Oh, sorry. Here we go. The GLMC one. It's it stands six meters tall and um, and it weighs 120 tons. So it takes in um, a pro it takes in two metric tons of of black mass, which is essentially crushed lithium ion batteries, or the um, or or at least the ferrous material. So that's the equivalent equivalent of 56,000 iPhone 8 batteries, for example. Um, you know, so slightly less Tesla batteries, of course, um, but it's a, it's a fairly large volume per day. Um, and it's got a very low carbon footprint, um, less than eight times some of our competitors, because it is a chemical reaction as opposed to a furnace or, um, or a smelting process. It's simply the power to generate our, our pumps and actuators and, and filtration systems, and the rest is a chemical reaction. So, yeah, and I don't want to bore you with any of this, but I guess where we fit in the, in, in, in the ecosystem is that the unfortunate thing is that currently batteries get recycled, meaning that they get, they get turned into black mass, and then they travel about 50,000 miles around the world to be turned back into cathode material, whereas our technology actually does this there and then on the um, on site. So, Fantastic. Thank you very much for adding uh, for the technical information on it. And that last picture of how you, it would look like yeah. um, in the near future is extremely helpful indeed. Um, so perhaps you could also touch upon some of the customers that you have to date. Yeah, absolutely. And who else would you love to hear from? Um, well, we'd love to hear from anybody that, that, that truly cares about sort of closing the loop and, and circular solutions, circular economy solutions. But um, we, are, we, we, we predominantly have two types of uh, groups of clients. And, you know, we have a fantastic client here in Singapore, our very first uh, client uh, to be, uh, to be honest and that was um and that's tess tess b down in 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 to us 
you know, probably South, Southeast, well, definitely Southeast Asia's most advanced lithium ion battery uh, recycling facilities. So we, we, you know, they're not only a client, they're now an investor and they're, uh, and a, just a great support. And we have a couple of other, so we have one other very large recycling, uh, lithium ion battery recycling group in, in uh, Nevada and, and, and the US. And, um, and then the other group of clients and people that we work with, we've got two other clients, which are major battery manufacturers. So battery manufacturers, so lithium ion battery recyclers see that our technology, you know, jumps up their profitability more than four times and, and creates efficiencies in a greener way, um, which is, is, is an obvious reason to start working with us. But battery manufacturers and OEMs, they look at, our, uh, they can see that there is a problem coming up and that is the control of their supply chain and access to raw materials for their batteries. So, you know, being able to rejuvenate that raw material and rejuvenate that cathode material is, is a way to control their supply chain. So we, we've also got two onboarded clients from that space. Perfect. Sounds like an absolute growing business there and the demand is, is only getting stronger with time. So on that note as well, how are you funding? How are you looking to grow your business? Are you currently looking for, uh, are you currently raising funds at the moment? Uh, well, you know, I think that any entrepreneur or anybody in a startup would agree with me to say that, you know, raising funds is a is a continuous process. It's not one that we start and stop. So I'm always to, always open to talk to anybody um, that's interested in in investing or or you know being part of the Green Lion team in any uh, well yeah the Green Lion pride we call it in in any way shape or form. Um, we are currently just about to close our Series A, so we have some great partners which are. Um, are, uh, have, have made some commitments to us, but it's, it's not, not exactly close just now. Yeah. Thank you. And one last question. Could you perhaps let us know or share with us the vision for your business, aspirations, and um, what you wish the world could and would look like in terms of how you can address sustainability? Yeah, I think, um, you know, touching on, um, on, on Reza's comments earlier, uh, I, I do believe that there's no reason to own batteries. And I think that, um, you know, talking about answering your last question first, looking to the future, it's my hope that, you know, batteries are just a, a part of a truly circular economy that they're used for, for an outcome, you know, driving electric vehicles or, uh, electrification of um, and storage of, of renewable projects, uh, whatever they need to be, and then they just come back and they're they're leased effectively, you know, and that we we never lose any of that material to landfill ever again. That's my my hope and our our sort of mission as Green Lion. Um, what the future holds for us is, um, you know, obviously unicorn status, but. We need to get there by um, working with, we, you know, our technology is currently the only solution in the world for taking spent lithium ion batteries to cathode material. It's the fastest process in the world. And, um, and so what we're up against right now is people with more cash than us, not as good technology, but we have to get this technology distributed broadly. Um, we're working with, you know, I believe some of the best first clients in the world but we need to we need to you know make sure that we can sell 92 of these machines and they're big they're big machines and they're they're costly. Um, we've tried to optimize that for our clients so they don't pay much up front. But you know if we can sell 92 machines, we can have a cumulative revenue of over a billion, and we're really heading the right direction. Fantastic. And on that note, um, Leon, thank you very much for your time and. Uh, for those of you who are interested to invest or find out more about uh, Green Lithium Ion, please reach out to Leon or myself, MoveSG. And uh, on MoveSG behalf, thank you very much, Leon. Thank you so much for having me. Cheers. Thanks, Sai Hoon and Leon. Uh, next up, we would like to in uh, invite Mr. Ben Hollis, 
from Polymathian as well as Angela from Rainmaking. Over to you guys. Thanks, Sheila. Um, and hey, Ben, calling in from, from down under. You're still in Australia, right? I am. All right. Well, thanks for making the time. And everybody, I'm, I'm really I'm really excited to have Ben with us here because I feel that um, data and optimization, these are buzzwords that everyone sort of floats around and everyone is interested in doing things smarter, but not everyone quite grasps, I think, what is possible today? What can you optimize? How well can you use your data? And um, I, I believe the polymathian guys have really figured that out. Uh, selfishly, I'm also excited because they're proof that you can use math to change the world. I'm a big nerd. I feel like Ben and his team are big nerds and they help everyone they work with look and act smarter, which is good for both the planet and, and your bottom line. So uh, Ben, I'll let you take it away to tell everyone a little bit more about uh, Polymathian and what you're doing to help businesses and sustainability today. Okay, I'll just try and share my screen. Uh, hopefully that comes through. Uh, can you see us? Can everyone see a slide deck? Yeah, we can see it. Okay, I'll just leave it in non presenter mode to avoid any sharing of different screens. Um, so, yeah, so my name is Ben Hollis. I work for a, an industrial mathematics company called Polymathian. Um, Polymathian delivers significant value to its customer base. Uh, by applying industrial mathematics to complex planning and scheduling problems. We build hosted software tools for heavy industry that solves some planning and scheduling problem that they have with some frequency, either they have to solve this problem every day or, or maybe once a week for next week or something like that. We license those tools to, to, to industry so that they can um, uh, run their operations more efficiently. Uh, every now and then we'll dip into the consulting realm where customers might ask us to use the tools we've licensed to them on their behalf uh, to help the perhaps their modeling team is under load or, or they're trying to do something new. Um, so we're a software development company first and we, we end up consulting every now and then uh, uh, using the tools that we've built and that we've licensed to the marketplace. Um, these four boxes essentially represent what industrial mathematics is. Um, we use sort of a combination of, of one or more of these sort of uh, uh, areas of, of uh, applied maths or, or, or um, uh, sort of computer learning, if you like, to solve complex problems for heavy industry. Um, what we're finding more and more is it's often the combination of sort of two of these sort of disciplines that, that are required to be brought together to solve um, a particular problem for a particular customer. A great example is one of the case studies I'll, I'll sort of go on to at the end if I have time quickly, but it sort of marries um, our statistical analysis and a little bit of simulation to create the data required to drive a real-time optimization tool to dispatch a complex network of energy generating assets. So it's often the combination of these these techniques together that, that, that adds the most value to customers. Um, uh, Polymathian sort of grew up differentiating itself in solving very complex optimization problems, but, but we've had to diversify into, into these other areas. Um, we often add a lot of value to our customers. Uh, it sort of depends on how sophisticated the customer is uh, in their sort of planning and scheduling function for the problem they're solving before we engage with them. Uh, maybe they're uh, uh, solving completely manually, in which case when you bring a, an applied maths tool to bear to the problem, you can often generate them a lot of money or save them or, or mitigate a lot of risk. Um, uh, never fail to be surprised at how unsophisticated multi-billion dollar companies can be at controlling their very complex operations. Um, Polymathian is sort of quite fortunate in that it's really a golden age for a company like Polymathian to be born in, if you like. In the last sort of 10 years, computing power has, has increased almost 400 fold. Um, uh, the advances in sort of uh, the industrial mathematics area or, or, or op operations research academia, if you like, that's been encoded in software has meant that that software is almost a factor of 10 times faster. And when you marry that with, you know, platform as a service, you know, think Amazon as a great example, uh, it means you can now solve problems with technology 
faster than you could have ever done before. So where there's a lot of tailwinds behind a company like Polymathian, you know, that have only been around in the last decade that really help it, help it be successful. Um, Polymathian sells and has licensed a range of different products to heavy industry that solve very different planning and scheduling problems. Um, and I'll just give you a quick description of, of each of them sort of quite quickly, and then I'll go into one case study and we might be out of time. Starting from left to right, Bolt. Bolt is used by um, large miners to help them optimise their post-mining value chains. So you might have on the west coast of Australia, you might have a range of uh, iron ore mines that have to cooperate in some way through the rail network and at the port um, uh, to blend specific qualities of iron ore to make products that you might sell overseas to customers. That's quite a complex optimization problem to solve. Um, Orb is sold to uh, companies that mine gold or um, uh, lead or zinc or bauxite, uh, usually hard rock underground miners. And we have uh, real-time optimization tools to help them dispatch their uh, fleets of underground trucks, if you like, trucks and diggers. Uh, Race is used uh, to help plan and schedule complex rail-based value chains. So it's used on the east coast of Australia um, uh, to rail um, all of the wheat that's exported out of some states in Australia, familiar with Australia's geography in Victoria and, and New South Wales, and same on the west coast, uh, to rail bauxite and wheat there. Um, solo, we help um, assign marine pilots to inbound and outbound vessel movements in the three biggest ports in Australia. So if you're getting on a, um, a cruise liner out of the port of Sydney, uh, the marine pilot that pilots that pilots that or drives that vessel out of the harbour, uh, the one that's allocated will be decided by the software we've written. Uh, Vault. Vault is uh, a very exciting tool we have and sort of most similar to some of the previous discussions that, that, have, that have been given here. Uh, it controls uh, networks of complex energy generating assets uh, in real time. And the foundation customer there was actually a Singaporean based multinational utilities company that has operations around the world. Uh, gear is used to help uh, plan uh, maintenance for, for, for fixed plants. So if you own a range of um, large fixed plant that are, uh, require maintenance with some frequency, making sure you can, can do that maintenance in a safe way and that that, uh, that individual plant or network of plants still can produce the finished product thereafter uh, is actually quite a tricky optimization problem. I have one case study that I'll probably talk about quickly just to cement in, um, uh, you know, sort of what this combination of different branches of industrial mathematics brought together into a online tool can do, if you like. So this is, um, uh, this is a case study for uh, a site in uh, northeast UK. Uh, it's an industrial complex that has a range of essentially cogeneration energy assets. So these assets make electricity for local manufacturing plants and they make steam for those same manufacturing plants. Uh, the, the assets are, are heterogeneous, so they, there's a combination of, of gas turbines, uh, biomass boilers, uh, and energy from waste uh, boilers as well. And uh, uh, this network of assets has to be dispatched in real time to make sure that different pressures of steam are always supplied to uh, sort of on-site customers, and about 40 of those. Um, uh, their power needs are also met, but if there is opportunity to sell power into the grid or dial your assets down and buy power in from the grid, you're doing that as efficiently as you can. Uh, it's a great example of a, uh, a real-time application of an optimization tool to a very complex uh, uh, sort of network where the optimization problem never ever stops. Thanks so much, Ben. It's it's clear that there's so much there's so much that you could do with uh, with industrial maths. So thanks for sharing. Um, and and you were telling me right that all of these use cases and the different products that you developed were actually it happened because you worked really closely with one particular customer or a set of early customers and looked at all these other use cases to which industrial math could be applied. 
So if we zoom out a little bit, right? I mean, for the people on the call, startups, corporate in the Singapore landscape, you know, what types of problems should, um, you know, which types of companies would benefit the most from using something like industrial math or what types of problems should we be trying to solve with this to have the impact on climate change? Yeah, any, any company that has sufficiently complex, uh, 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 a sufficiently complex planning and scheduling problem that they have to solve uh, with you know, reasonably frequently uh, uh, where improvements in the efficiency of that operation could have a material impact on uh, essentially their emissions and their bottom line, uh, then uh, if they're not using software that was built in sort of the last decade, uh, they're probably not running those operations as well as they could because what you can do in the last decade you couldn't do beforehand or even sort of more recently than the last decade. So if you have you know, a complex scheduling problem in your business, then uh, uh, you wanna make sure you're using the right software uh, to make sure you're using your assets as efficiently as you can. Thanks, so, Ben. So, and you're right, you go. Oh, no, were you gonna add something? I was just gonna give you a couple of examples, you know, dispatching, dispatching energy generation assets in real time, like the one I just described, like the one I just spoke about, um, uh, uh, or dispatching a, a, a shipping network where you're trying to make sure that the ship journeys are as efficient as you can, and you're forming you're forming the you know the smallest queues of vessels or ports where possible when you're trying to manage customer inventories, mm -hmm. or perhaps you're planning a rail network and you want to make sure that that rail network may have a mixture of diesel and electric trains, and you want to make you want to make sure you get the best value out of your electric trains as you possibly can. Um, there are many, many, many examples. Very cool. Thanks so much for sharing. And I think we, we were also speaking about, right, um, before this, the impact of, of COVID and sort of supply chain disruptions now and why the ability to optimize something in real time is suddenly so much more important. Because I think maybe even people who have sophisticated planning today, the plans almost never stick anymore. Um, so what's your thought on that? Yeah, yeah. Um... It's the ability to replan that matters the most. So if you can produce one plan, and perhaps that plan might be a good one when you make it, but conditions change, which essentially means the input data that you use to make that plan has now sufficiently changed, that's perhaps the wrong plan for you to try and defend. So it really comes down to your ability to produce a new plan with changing data and make sure you're always trying to be as close to achieving that new plan as you can. Um, so it comes down to agility. Um, uh, and that comes down to the, 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 the sort of the sophistication of the tools you have at your disposal and the agility of your business to consume a new plan and not defend an old out of date one. Um, so yeah, agility would probably be um, a broad description there for your answer. That sounds like good life advice as well as business <laughs> advice. <laughs> Thanks, Ben, so much for your time. And anybody who's you know keen to learn more, you can reach out to Ben directly or to myself. I think um, Sheila and the ESG team will make our contact details available. Thanks, Ben. Thank you. Thanks, Angela and Ben. I think last but not least, we'd we'll like to invite Dave, CEO of Carbon Click, and Julius from Starburst. Over to you guys. All Thank right. You. Thank you. Hi. Hi, everyone. Um, I think Dave, I think, is from New Zealand. I think currently, I think it's almost 9 p.m. Dave, right? Yeah, that's right. Yeah. So maybe I'd like to introduce, I think, the, the concept of carbon offset um, and the business of that is uh, has been around for quite some time. But here in uh, Starburst, I think we are intrigued by what Carbon Click is delivering on the sustainability front. Maybe I let uh, Dave, I think, to share uh, some overviews, and maybe I would like to actually ask some questions. All right? Yeah, Dave, sure. You know, I can I can run through a few slides as well if you like. But basically, Club Carbon Click um, was born to make climate action simple, and not only simple, but we saw the opportunity to raise the bar on the quantity and the level of impact, particularly in industries like air travel um, and transport and logistics. Yeah. Um, would you like me to share my screen? Yes, please do. Sure. Um, this is probably a good way of running through an overview exactly. of, of what we do. So hopefully you can see me okay or see this okay. We know we're all here for the same reason, is 
climate change is upon us and we've ignored too many calls to action in the past and now it's really caught up with us and we need to do something um, and not just something but we need to do a lot and we need to do it quickly but where do we start with this um, most businesses are really challenged by what can they do that actually makes a difference and just understanding um, how to measure, how to reduce and uh, where offsetting should play a role and, and where it shouldn't. The big thing is that most of the market, particularly millennials and Gen Zs, um, they really care about climate change and this creeps through the rest of the market quite a lot too. So these are your employees, these are your customers and their spend is shifting. So that means businesses have to act, whether because of taking a leadership position, um, like a lot of Singapore is taking that leadership position, but the rest of the world too uh, has to act because otherwise they're going to miss out on business. So there are only two options, either to reduce your carbon footprint, and this is the exciting stuff. This is the innovation, um, but some of this takes time to scale up. So alongside innovation there is offsetting and offsetting can be complex uh, it can also be a very powerful solution to help fight climate change um, and this is what we've we've brought about is how do we make it simpler how do we make it transparent and how do we make it more impactful for example uh, with offsetting you could have a pine forest um, like microsoft have and Yet with every degree of temperature change that we have, uh, you have a 750% more higher likelihood of that forest succumbing to forest fire. So uh, pine does nothing for biodiversity, but it also does, uh, although it grows and sequesters carbon quickly, the risk that it burns down again and emits that carbon back is high. So this is where Carbon Click um, can step in and make sure that um, any of this mitigation action is really genuine, impactful and long lasting. So we're not just deferring another problem till later. The really exciting thing is that customers um, and teams align well when both reductions uh, happen and offsetting happens to complement them. So you've seen the voluntary market grow 58% in the last 12 months alone. So it's now $748 million annually. These are people clicking to offset their flights or to offset something that, um, that they're purchasing. And businesses that are voluntary, voluntarily offsetting their emissions as well so that they can tell that story. How, how Carbon Click works with that technology to actually engage uh, your audience is A, via platforms like Shopify, Magento, WooCommerce. This is where a lot of businesses run their e-commerce side of the um, business. And we saw this scale up massively because of COVID, um, because people uh, had to learn how to shop online if they weren't already doing this before. And then there's the API stuff. This is the clever stuff that Carbon Click has built the platform uh, around. So this is um, uh, providing tools for airlines like Etihad Airways uh, so that they can present uh, accurate carbon offsetting in the booking flow path in an integrated way that makes it simple one click for a customer. Um, and, but what we've done is we've built transparency into that. So not only are the projects of a much higher impact, we provide transparency so the customers can actually see where their dollar has gone and have that proven to them. So that, that builds a lot of trust and respect back to the brand like Eddie had. Um, and then you've got climate friendly teams, which is how we engage your team so that all of the sustainability actions your business is taking um, resonates really well across the team because right now we find a lot of um, a lot of businesses uh, have a mix from young people to more senior people and some of them get climate change and some of them get sustainability initiatives and some of them feel left behind and even left out so but a lot of these people that feel left behind in the climate action movement these are the decision makers in the business so what we've done is we've uh, created the world's simplest single individual, uh, sorry, simplest individual carbon footprint calculator so that anybody, you you as listeners um, right now could go onto our website and 
ask what your carbon footprint is, and within 60 seconds you would have that answer. That's how we engage them, and then we give reduction tips as to how to reduce your footprint. Of course, the business gets all that aggregated data so they can see how the, the average carbon footprint of their team and how it's reducing over time with these tips. And that's another really powerful story they go and tell to their audience uh, about the genuine impact that they are having on this planet through taking leadership. Here's just an example of the traceability scheme and uh, traceability screen that we run. Now in this, we not only prove to you where your dollar has gone and any fee that comes out along the way like transaction fees, but also this is the opportunity for you to learn more about those projects, fall in love with those projects and the why behind it. Projects like uh, Shenzhen Natural Biogas in China and Doe Mountain Reforestation in the USA. Our platform automatically picks up where you are uh, in the world and automatically will select an offset basket close to you so that it makes maximum uh, connection to you. And the exciting thing um, that we can use our platform for to build sustainability as well as innovation is financing uh, green alternatives. So alternatives to the mainstream carbon offsets um, that there are not currently certification processes for. Uh, certification processes take a long time to come into play and we don't have a long time to solve this. So uh, through use of blockchain and um, alternative certification processes in 2022, we'll be able to offer carbon offsets that come through a different channel of, um, of certification. And that's what really excites me. And it means that we can help all of our uh, innovative industry in this space to be able to gain some funding uh, and green finance to help them by people wanting to do better uh, for the environment. Um, our impact so far is already 1.2 million trees um, worth of offsets that have been uh, effectively planted, protected, grown by our 90, over 90,000 individual contributors and over 750 customers, particularly the world's top businesses, um, the leaders in their fields. And uh, Etihad, for example, are one of the biggest movers of sustainable aviation fuels as well. So they're doing a lot to reduce their carbon footprint internally, as well as engaging their uh, staff on the journey and as well as engaging their customers on the journey. Um, we know when it's done poorly, uh, there can be a risk of greenwashing and we also provide uh, assistance to make sure our clients aren't going to get accused of greenwashing, uh, they're being honest, and also to protect our brand. Um, we certainly don't want to see the uh, impacts that H&M had last year or over the last two years with a 20% drop in revenue directly as a result of being called out publicly for greenwashing. Um, so the process we work through businesses with is first of all, um, licensing. So we give you social license to operate um, by looking through your marketing collateral um, and looking at any third party uh, endorsements that you might have or that you might need to be able to go public with these statements. Uh, we provide a light audit to sense check everything here. Uh, we give you platform access to the Carbon Click platform contents and support for the marketing activities, uh, as well as uh, all of the dashboard reporting tools that you might need internally for your stakeholders, as well as externally. The idea is climate action made simple. Um, so we certainly want to keep to that theme. Um, the team product engages your staff and then finally, um, we support that PR and marketing so that you can really actually capitalize on the sustainability leadership that you're taking. So thank you. Thank you very much for um, listening and for your enthusiasm for sustainability in the transport and logistics sector. Um, right. I'm happy to ask questions or answer questions rather. All right, Dave. I think thanks for your wonderful presentation. Maybe I have a question. All right. So I think the myth for carbon offset is always, are they real and trustworthy? So I'm sure in your earlier slide, you mentioned, I think about the traceability side, but can you elaborate a little bit more about how Carbon Click is actually building trust? Maybe um, just a point earlier, you mentioned about uh, blockchain. 
Can you also elaborate a little bit about that? Yeah, absolutely. So, so trust is the biggest uh, barrier to offsetting. And in fact, through addressing that traceability and transparency alone, we, uh, we have about double the uptake of car um, from, other, from the average program. So an airline that chooses carbon off carbon click to present has yeah. about double the number of clicks um, because of addressing that, that trust issue. Yep. The second thing is having high standards of offsets. So because we reject two thirds of the offsets that we uh, do due diligence on, um, because we're looking for long-term additionality, we're looking for biodiversity addition and social benefits. Um, we we are able to tell that story with uh, with clear conviction, clear evidence, um, and and build that trust. And that trust carries to the brands that we are working with. So we want to be seen as uh, as the brand um, for the upper echelon of carbon. And we actually want to raise the bar and raise the standard of carbon offsets. At COP26 this year, we're going to carry the theme with us um, in in meetings of providing a. Um, a rating system yep. which rates the, the additionality value of carbon offsets because right now all you've got to base it on is price and the yep. general public don't know what the price should be for any uh, set uh, offset so it's a confusing market that we're hoping to um, deconstruct and, and build trust into and the blockchain is quite an, a good way of bringing trust into the non-certified credits. The non-certified credits are the latest innovations, which are well ahead of what any certification is designed to be able to approve. And sorry, really sorry, Dave, to cut you off, I think because for the interest of time, sure. maybe um, I think we have the last questions coming in. I think, um, so I think your earlier question, you mentioned about green financing. Could you maybe give a quick, a quick snippet of that? To everyone. Yeah, so, so uh, I mean, from from our perspective, there yep. is a huge market demand um, to support green financing, both from individual consumers who want to finance uh, through carbon offsetting as a currency. They want to finance innovation, and our, our market is ready for this now. Uh, we've already tested it, and we're already uh, launching this in 2022. Yep. But also through, uh, we've seen in the investment circuit, um, businesses like Carbon Click, um, and, and our peers that are working on the reductions. Um, this, is, this is a major outcome. Yep. Um, and, and you're seeing um, some of the uh, the NASDAQ uh, yep. registries of the world starting yep. to ask for not only financial returns, yep. but what are your environmental returns so that we can start actually reporting on this as well. And people can invest looking at financial versus environmental and social returns in a business, knowing that they might take a financial hit if um, they might volunteer for a slight financial reduction if they know that the environmental benefits are greater. Yeah. Um, all right. So I think uh, I think in the interest of time, I think um, I thank you. I think for Dave. I think for 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 having this wonderful presentation about uh, the Carbon Click. Um, and yeah, for people interested in Carbon Click, please reach out to ESG, to Sheila, or even myself, and to the rest of the team. Um, thank you. Thanks, Dave and Julius. Uh, I think with that, thank we you. have come to the end of the forum. I think. Uh, we will also share, I think, on the screen some of the contact details so that uh, anyone from the audience, if you are keen, please feel free to reach out to the relevant accelerators and startups. And I think for the panelists, please uh, stay on. I think we would like to take a group photo. And we thank the other the audience for joining us today. I think it was a very interesting session on sustainability and the different technologies and trends. Hopefully it's a fruitful session for all.